I think we have all material on Canvas. And of course, um, some of you I know from previous lectures in the past, and of course, also welcome to everyone who is new in one of my courses. Uh, these are interesting times, as you know. So we all adopt to new technology like Canvas. We had Ugla before. And uh, this is exciting, but also challenging here and there. So we have to change here and there some modus operandi. But we do our best to keep it running at the university, as you know. I think I have some background noise here. So please mute yourself if you, you know, not talking, please. Excellent. Thank you. So again, we have several news, not only the COVID-19 crisis that um, we somehow overcome as humans, you throw new challenges at us and we find a new way of responding. So we go completely virtual, which is not so nice, but you have seen my picture, so you know how I look at. So I would skip the video here to preserve the bandwidth and the audio to the best possible quality. Um, the second aspect beyond COVID, of course, is now the virtual space that you have in Canvas. I know many of you know Ugla from the past. Uh, that also was my tool for the last seven years here, the university. Um, this is now transforming mo almost everything to Canvas. While I was adopting this, I had here and there some errors, and I'm sure I heard some of you and others have also some errors and didn't get some messages and so on, but it will hopefully work, I guess, in the next couple of weeks. So today we have really um, this really ramp up of the course. So I will talk a lot of high level aspects to get a, a view on cloud computing and big data that we're gonna tackle. We will cover in the prologue um, any sorts of questions that would be on your mind. So anytime you have a question, uh, my suggestion would be that you either, um, you know, just ask a question or you put it in the chat. We will go then in specific areas uh, in this kind of presentation through it and then we'll cover all of them. My suggestion from previous years, however, is uh, listen first because I cover a lot of things, um, how to do assignments, what's the weight of assignments and exams, what's the content of the lectures, how um, we do quizzes. So all sorts of questions, of course, are kind of in this prologue lecture. So, um, and also, of course, to think a little bit about this logos that you now see here on the first page, this largely is integrated in the whole course. It's a very fascinating area, which I work in since uh, 16 years. And of course, it's highly moving. There are new projects. Um, there's quite some European drive right now to become independent from US and other nations. So definitely Europe put together different pieces for high performance computing and for cloud computing to stay together. Um, basically also really trying to get Europe to more technology foundations in this area, creating chips and so forth. So before I now talk about each of these interesting logos individually, also um, note that this is here now recorded. So I should mention this, um, it's an aspect of GDPR. And of course the recording helps also fellow students. And you can assume that at least in the future, we will always record um, all the lectures. It includes the practical lectures as well. So let's start a little bit with um, the idea of this course by looking to the outline of the course. Um, we have here 16 lectures, excluding of course a prologue right now that gives you just an overview of the course to see if that's really something for you. Um, we start with a very interesting introduction about cloud computing and big data, why they're both intertwined to a, let's say, major degree. Also today in the prologue, I will already motivate this by also saying that machine learning, deep learning, AI, topics you have heard in the media probably, but also high performance computing, these also go along with cloud computing and big data. In a way, it's a really um, technology area which is extremely intertwined and I will make the case why today, but also come back to it in one where we also cover some technology foundations. So what is a many core chip? What is a multi core chip and so forth. So then we're going a little bit into some practical details. You can assume that this course has now been teached several times. And of course I was able to integrate feedback many times 
And with this, we also want to do something useful with big data, not know how to work with it. So we start in lecture two and three, really right with some practical details of making use of big data for machine learning. Um, for those of you who didn't know what machine learning is and so don't worry about it, uh, I will make case of today and we have a, let's say, very streamlined introduction in lecture two and three. And we will see how this is very nicely supported today with technologies like Apache Spark in different cloud vendors today. So Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon Web Services and many other cloud vendors these days have a very good support for machine learning because it's by far beyond statistics also how you can make use of big data. Then we come a little bit in lecture four back to some conceptual aspects. So scalability is a key word here, thinking about that a data center in the clouds needs to be designed differently than let's say a small computing center that you have somewhere in the cell of a company, or if you want here from the university, our computing center. Of course, this is already um, let's say production stability, but if you go really to lots of lots of cores, lots of lots of nodes, and then have to also support many, many different users, you're quickly at the technology called virtualization. So I think some of these technologies you have heard maybe in other courses like operating systems, for instance, covering some aspects of it. And we will come back to this and see how this really scales with the clouds, why they are so successful used today and also looking a little bit at energy efficiency and so forth. <clears throat> also, when we think about then going um, from assignment one to assignment two during the course of the, next, uh, of the next weeks, we really want to start early with assignments so that you have your exam period free of this. You will see we dive again in practical lectures. Um, here we start with a map reduced computing paradigm which has been uh, very successful in the past and is often still adopted today in production settings because there's also quite some momentum in the media and most notably jobs in that area. We also then go for deep learning lectures. And the reason here is not to bring you really too hard what exactly machine learning is, what deep learning is. There are other people here in the university that can teach about this. Uh, we have machine learning courses, we have deep learning courses. Here we will focus, of course, how we use it with the clouds, how we use it with big data together in order to fix a certain application problem. Meaning this is not a deep down mathematical course where you have to do statistical learning theory, uh, through uh, different four or five lectures uh, that I teach in the past and other occasions. Here is really a streamlined introduction to deep learning more from an application uh, user perspective. So this will cover largely one part of the assignments where we use deep learning with GPUs, graphical processing units. And after that, we basically go back to some conceptual aspects, although of course they have their practical aspects today everywhere you look. So essentially you see three different levels where clouds are structured in and we will take care to build that up one by one. The first is infrastructure as a service where you basically have bare metal as a sense of just infrastructure in terms of computing, in terms of storage, um, very pure infrastructure where you can build on to build cloud applications. Then platform as a service is something I refer to as Lego blocks usually. So the Lego blocks meaning um, you can pull two different parts of the platform together in order to stick them together in order to create some services of benefits for you or your company uh, and so forth. And then the software as a service lectures really full blown applications that are already living in the cloud as a software that you can have, you know, with billing aspects like swiping your credit card and so forth. So all of this, we come back in the second part of this lecture today. So don't worry if you don't understand all of that, we will go one by one through all these lectures to also show you what exactly you can expect from these lectures. Then we will, when we have introduced this more conceptual aspects, we will look a little bit more into an aspect called big data analytics. It's also a very huge area uh, today in clouds and also words like cloud data mining, which is related to machine learning and deep learning, but has a little bit more practical aspects using uh, shopping data analysis and, and things like that. Um, another interesting practical aspect is the container management, singularity, Docker, everything which means you don't have to pull a full operating system 
to basically deploy your application in a virtualization manner is here a very streamlined approach to management of many, many different applications and many different services in those containers. This is also de facto standard in cloud environments today and we will look beyond that um, basically in, in different areas. Towards the end of the course, so this means we are already um, having hopefully done all the assignments. Um, we will start with some final lectures of thinking about if you will be in charge from your company and want to create a cloud. So you basically sitting in one company or in one academic institution and you need to buy um, not cloud computing resources. Instead, the boss wants you to create a cloud on your own. Um, I show you a little bit around what OpenStack offers you in terms of this. You can have also very nice building blocks to create your own cloud today. What many people are doing, there are things like hybrid clouds where people do their own clouds and then augment services from Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure. So this is also um, very much known and even people have built on top of OpenStack today to build already their, let's say, advanced cloud services. Then very interesting topics and in the beginning of the lectures when I was hearing this several years ago, uh, people will start asking this, so I thought let's make lectures inside this course about this. Everybody knows Facebook, everybody knows YouTube and so forth, but how that works, it's cloud services. So the question would be how they operate, how they scale to millions of users. And we will learn that's not run real big database. There are many databases, many analytics, many machine learning aspects in the cloud that work on all the big data from online social networking. And one key term in this area are graph databases. So graph traversal, the friends of friends of friends and so forth. But we will cover this in lecture 14 before we go um, basically to another element which becomes more popular every day um, around big data streaming. So what happens if you have new measurement devices, new tools that give you data on the stream gigabyte by gigabyte every second. We will look at some interesting um, scenarios and applications where really you cannot keep all the data. It's impossible. So you have to find a way to filter or you have to basically look into the stream and see what's useful right now because you cannot keep everything. So um, there are tools around that we will look in. And then of course the 16th lecture is the epilogue where we will discuss lots of practical insights from the course. So not only a summary um, and prepare you for the exam, more notably, we will also look together for the um, job descriptions that are around. So that's something I did many years now. So discussing what job options you could have given this course and maybe some other related ones like high performance computing or machine learning and so forth. So this is a very, let's say, concluding lecture, very open also in discussion for um, feedback to this course and so forth. So you see it's a mix between practical topics and theoretical topics. We really start quickly with practical topics already next week. And uh, with this, um, let's come to the course motivation really. Um, thinking about that parallel processing and distributed computing um, basically um, are key elements of this course. Also cloud operate this way. And the course has really a comprehensive approach on this. So we don't do too much theoretics. We want to have here a course which really you can apply in practice so that you go out there in your company and you can take different AWS services from Amazon together to really create an added value for some kind of an application. We will use um, elements that scale, meaning big data is a big topic. Um, that means not that you can, um, let's say, uh, sample some data or you just have a couple of megabytes usually to look at. Here in the course, we maybe for some practical um, elements of the course, we will do this. We need to do this because there are so many students enrolled in this course. Otherwise, we're also running out of computing capacity here and there. But all what you learn, essentially, you can apply and scale up, right? Meaning not using one GPU maybe, but also using different GPUs and I show you how. The course addresses with this also lots of new elements and graphical processing units and the big drive from it, I'm very sure you have heard from NVIDIA uh, during the course of the last uh, couple of years. And um, with this, we see also ARM-based systems and you know new technology appearing, but still GPUs are the way to go right now. 
A100 chips, V100 chips. So we look a little bit in, around these technologies, in particular also why they are so efficient for machine learning tools, deep learning tools, which are so often used to make sense of big data in clouds today. A little bit we also go here and there to some uh, environmental aspects. You might also call them a little bit political aspects like the European Open Science Cloud, where people of you have heard maybe from the Patriot Acts in the past, also now in the media it's very new um, about the US laws versus European laws, who is allowed to see what data sets in the clouds and not, who can access it. This is something which drives also the European cloud providers to really be independent from US so that the laws cannot grip there, so to speak. And uh, these are all things we put here and there in the lecture. However, we keep a really practical view on the commercial setting so that you can also have this really use in practice after this course. So the outcomes really are um, dealing with scalability as you here see. Um, that means largely parallel processing, distributed computing in clouds. We will absolutely know what high performance clusters are, not so much on programming them. So there's another course called high performance computing, which is then for parallelization on a very low level, meaning MPI, meaning um, OpenMP. Some of you have been in the course last year, high performance computing. It will be also next fall and it's a complementary course. But here in this course, we're not going too much to the programming level. Here we rather think how to use systems, how we basically have a script that we can run through. Um, I usually call these kind of exercises walkthrough exercises or assignments where you use different cloud services in order to get a feeling for it. Here and there it involves a little bit of Python, um, but definitely not low level C programming like we see for instance when you program high performance clusters. Still you know how to use them, how to really use them in a scalable design, uh, meaning that you can have high throughput low workloads, lots of lots of data uh, put through these systems, which you also see in big data centers, not only from Amazon, but also Facebook, from NVIDIA, and if you want also here in Iceland in the Vern Global Data Center. Then the um, general idea of having then some applications along the lines, machine learning, deep learning, you will learn a little bit about this, but of course you will be not experts in this. Um, of course, here and there it sheds maybe a light on what you can do after this course. So that's why the learning outcomes in this area might be also interesting to know, okay, do I want to specialize more in databases? Do I want to specialize more in machine learning or deep learning techniques? And the latter definitely has a large, large job market. So I was invited uh, to the German um, Bundestag and this is something what we constantly always um, discuss. So we have a lack of people, of experts in machine learning and deep learning. So this is something which is everywhere around. It's more and more used, but we don't have people working on it. And when you finish this course, you're in the perfect, um, let's say, foundation basis to uh, also become an expert of scalable machine learning and deep learning. So this is something what I can give you on the way. Um, Basically, what you can then do with it is you will be able to set these systems up and definitely work with machine learning and deep learning um, or data mining. You can perform big data analytics. And if you have a job description somewhere, you will see that many of the things we cover in this um, will be actually matching quite the job descriptions you see once you want to embark on a journey in a company like that. Okay. Oop. Just maybe shortly about me. Um, you have maybe seen already my professional website. I put in the Converse area where you can look through the different teaching areas, but also maybe the, through the papers. Um, I make this shortly. So just 16 years experience. That means I have seen a lot uh, in terms of cloud computing. In fact, I have seen the birth of cloud computing when I was doing grid computing at CERN with a large Hadron Collider, being a strategic director of middleware. And over the time we have seen that all the concepts we had in research and engineering uh, actually moved to the commercial setup and then uh, become more and more the clouds that we know of today. We worked together with Microsoft and in the back end, it was still grid computing while it was already sold as clouds at that time. 
So this is really exciting to see that um, commercial environments really have picked up that, but is really a research or scientific endeavor in the beginning, or let's say 20, 16 years ago. And now everybody lives with apps that are actually largely driven by cloud computing in the back end. It's fascinating to see. Of course, it's always related, as I said, with high performance computing. And this was always an idea when you are at a supercomputing center like me and Jülich for now 16 years, it is always big data, right? If you have the supercomputers, they always deal with big data. At that time, it was just many gigabytes, which we couldn't maybe work with. Now we have terabytes. Now people talk about the exascale. So we have exabytes we have to work with a lot. So it's also, of course, uh, follows more and more an exponential scale. An interesting aspect maybe for some of you who want to be more in the academic area or want to use HPC and clouds and so on here in Iceland. I'm also the uh, governing board member for Iceland at the European HPC, Euro HPC joint undertaking, which is more strategic endeavor between all the countries in Europe, how we bring HPC bolder and bigger into the countries. And there we got lots of funding now um, to really make this happening in Iceland. So there we will see a lot. Maybe finally, shortly university courses. Um, I have a proven track of HPC teaching, uh, statistical data mining, where when I was starting here together with Thomas Philipp Runason, uh, later with Nikolai. And then we basically um, have separated the concerns more um, cloud computing big data is also many times now I gave this course either here at the university, but also several times outside at some Jülich um, tutorials. The same goes for machine learning courses, deep learning courses, and so forth. Again, if you want to know more, everything is basically online. So in research and engineering, when you are in the academic area, we get largely rated by how much we do public um, exposure of our material, meaning that Twitter tweets, Facebook likes, and so on are all our, let's say, um, measurements right now. So the more we do this, the better it is for the projects we are in. So this has changed. Uh, today, it's not any more important that you just have a web page for some project. Today, you really need tweets, you really need Facebook or in other, you know, LinkedIn and all sorts of social media to really known and you know get your credits and uh, having good evaluations in the project so you will see also that i heavily tweet around this in our course today and during the course of the next month and of course i welcome you to also check social media out usually you find me on twitter uh, facebook linkedin and instagram of course, before I publish here faces of you guys, then I always will do a GDPR issue and will explain it uh, when we, for instance, will look into of one of the Vern Global Centers, maybe have a look there together, making pictures and your faces are known. Then of course I will before ask if we can put it on social media or will gray out people. That goes without question. Um, Maybe just shortly where I'm coming from, Yuli Supercomputing Center. Of course, I'm also a full professor here at the university, but also I maintain a research group leader position at the Yuli Supercomputing Center in Germany. You see it's in the middle of the forest, uh, kind of the Robin Hood setting is one of the largest research centers of Germany, 6,000 people, 5,000 to 6,000. It depends on if you count the visiting scientists. And we have a long, long proven track in information technology around HPC, clouds and big data. But also, of course, in the campus, we have physics, material sciences, nanotechnology, neuroscience, medicine, all sorts of applications that usually work with us in the supercomputing center to get really problems solved. So really applied research, uh, what is happening there. The University of Iceland, I hope the many of you know, um, because you're enrolled in it. But of course, I know from the past also, I have several Erasmus students or so that actually still want to know more. An interesting area is maybe that um, it is one of the number, uh, highest numbers in remote sensing in the world, which is interesting because we work ourselves in remote sensing, me and my research group. Uh, some members here from my research group are online. So Shadi, for instance, is here. He will give at some point in time also an invited talk, one PhD student of mine and others might follow. And uh, so this is definitely interesting. It has a long collaboration now with Jülich. It's around seven, eight years now. 
And of course, we're going there with different PhDs back and forth. There are lots of opportunities um, to bridge to Germany. So if you have interest in that, of course, here being in Iceland, um, then let me know. And it's an interesting area looking from my German perspective, because here things are partly more practical. While in Germany, it's all very bureaucratic. Um, here, you can really do a lot of good things. So it's quite nice to be around here in Iceland as well. When it comes to our research group, and just to let you know a little bit how that is now related to practical insights in cloud computing and big data, um, you see um, my research group is at the University of Iceland and Jülich. We have in, in this regard a cross-sectional team deep learning. So we do really deep learning a lot in the research group. But with this comes also lots of other aspects like artificial intelligence, how to use uh, facilities like the supercomputers with big data, with large data sets. So how we create new systems can, that can work with this because uh, usually the systems that you can find and buy there um, are always a little bit older. As I said earlier, if you know a little bit about GPUs, this was always, let's say, P, Pascal, it was Volta architectures. Now we look actually at A100 as the next level. So there, there's always like innovation. And this is largely taken with EU projects that you see here, like Deepest. And they will play also a very interesting part because they provide us here with some resources financially to get people back and forth from Germany to here, but also um, basically having technology access that we want to play around in deep learning without any cost. You will see the cloud usually costs and we will go to the cloud environment also uh, for some credits that we get for free, but it's largely limited. That's why here and there for tackling big data, we also want to work a little bit on the GPUs provided by this project. And usually many of the important things why we do all of this is the top that you see here, many communities. I work a lot in the healthcare area, medical applications, but also remote sensing is one of our key areas that we work in. Uh, so satellite data and use this with machine learning and deep learning technologies. So, and you see throughout the lecture that parts of this, I will always integrate to also give you an understanding um, that these things are really practically used. And here you see, for instance, also an, an example, one of the Icelandic site with Landsvikjun, where we use deep learning for power lines. And actually one master student of mine, Gudmunde, was working on this, but also Soccer Watch, which was actually a spin-off of my research group that created now a company of automated um, camera, um, basically tracking of soccer matches. And we will look into this uh, during the course of the next weeks, of course, and I shed a short light today as well on it. When we look on the um, intertwined perspective, really, that things are driven forward, um, meaning that if you are now doing this and you pursue maybe a little bit more of you on an academic area, so some of the courses, course members might do this, um, then, of course, these initiatives I have here also put in, EuroHPC and European Open Science Cloud both drive all activities around cloud computing, big data and high performance computing. So especially EuroHPC is relatively new, but we have already projects with the Admire project where we do applications of co-design. Interesting for at least the Icelanders here maybe is the EuroCC project in Iceland that we will kickstart probably in October together with many other users here that you see a little bit on the screen here. Egil Skulason, Hannes Jonsson, uh, and many others um, are part of this, Thomas Philipp Brunason, Lotta. So we all are kind of the HPC community or big data community or machine learning community here. And we got some funding now to structure ourselves a bit more like other countries have done in the past and then really um, speak together as one nation. Um, and you see also we do this collaboratively with the University of Reykjavik, right? Like for instance, Henning Ulverson, we work closely with and also Weatherstovan and others. Um, this is really an interesting time that we come more closely together. And this goes for HPC, but also for the cloud aspects. You see here, um, the European Open Science Cloud is really an extremely large endeavor, but we have also Nordic fraction on it. So basically here you find Sweden, Finland, Iceland, and all other Nordic countries put together really to have a project. And 
actually providing some of the big data services for the application communities in Iceland and of course the other Scandinavian countries. So this is all a little bit a different perspective. So we're going from some technical views from now some strategic views also why this is still relevant. The one is of course what you get to know very soon about Microsoft, Amazon, the commercial clouds, but also in the research and in the scientific areas, this becomes more and more relevant. So it is a topic that is important, cloud computing, high performance computing, parallelization is large. Another area which is then really related to this um, in big data, and I want to make now the last, uh, basically the next part of this lecture, really the point why that is related and to really understand a little bit why we tackle all of this in one course. Um, and this is the first one where you have to understand that AI is really something very huge. Artificial intelligence includes robotics and all sorts of things to really mimic human behavior. Uh, machine learning, deep learning is something we focus now here in the course more as applications, um, largely as a subfraction of artificial intelligence and also very much involved in the Helmholtz AI. So there are lots of job opportunities in Germany if you're interested. Um, there's a huge initiative which got multi-million funding and we have always an interest for search for good people so and hire them. So if you're interested in that. Um, but really deep learning now is something which you have seen in the media probably or heard from. That is really a big hype right now. And I remember the first discussions when we talked with Thomas Philip Runason, for instance, and I said, oh, that's a high hoax. So it will not work. And deep learning nets have been around many years ago. So um, this will not work. But today we really have evidence that it works. So they're extremely good applications. I'm sure you have heard about it. Largely everything which is about a vision which is about um, you know, analyzing images, computer vision aspects is really nowadays more or less um, driven by deep learning and we will see more and more why. So machine learning has some prerequisites and computing challenges and that's the point how it touches the cloud computing and where the big data really comes in. So usually you do machine learning when you think there's a pattern somewhere in the data some people call it today data science to really know more and you would have not exact mathematical formulas for it like the weather forecast right we have the physical laws numerical methods that we use and we teach actually in the high performance computing course so their machine learning could be complementary but will never let's say just better the physical formulas but if you don't have physical formulas then you go and look what data you have and maybe big data exists or data exists and then you can apply this machine learning techniques. And of course, this is not new and something from machine learning. It has been in signal processing, data mining, applied statistics everywhere. The key point now is that we see in the last 10 years, really uh, maybe 15 years that it gets massive amounts of data. So this is growing and the VECA or let's say the R tool that you have on your desktop is not working anymore. Um, Shadi here on the call, he is just, you know, using PIPA perfumery data for doing some analysis in his PhD for shopping behavior. And also there we face more and more gigabytes of data, which was maybe 10 years ago, just megabytes of data, if you got any data at all. So meaning that this data is growing exponentially. And with this, you really require some form of big data analytics. And this goes beyond the typical data analysis uh, with respect to an infrastructure, you really need something supporting your data analysis. And this means uh, on the one hand, storage capacity, computing, processing power, but also maybe networking to get access to the data. So all of this is really gets you connected to the big data. And that's where cloud computing comes in. That's where, you know, clouds largely fueled by high performance computing in the back are really relevant today and help you also with machine learning. <clears throat> one key driver of this right now is a technology called deep learning. And you see that here on the top, the difference to normal deep learning um, or to normal machine learning really, um, which was in the past was that neural networks usually were just, let's say, have a couple of layers. Now they're really deep, but it doesn't mean that they just put neurons after neurons in. And we have a whole lecture about deep learning. So don't worry if you don't understand everything. 
just think about that, you know, machine learning was always a little bit like you look at the data, you look what features you could extract from this in order to create a model, to explain a pattern, to work on the pattern, to learn essentially from the features to create a model. So deep learning does something differently. It will be, you know, using data and automatically will engineer features, at least partly to create a model. And this has, of course, some time savings, but needs, on the other hand, lots of complexity. One good example that you see here is the recognition of faces. You see deep learning can do this now even with a fraction of the face present, while um, algorithms in the past really had challenges with this. Or the number recognition here could be also done these days by deep learning networks very quickly. So i play a little bit here a short video about this just to get an insight how these networks work, but we have a whole lecture about it. So for the sake of the time, um, I stop this here also because I think the convolutional neural networks that you just have seen are perhaps one of the biggest breakthroughs that deep learning has done these days. It really has an interesting way of having these features of the two that you just see there in the, uh, in the video really carved out and put in so-called feature maps. So really learning the features from the image you present and all of this is now encapsulated in many deep layers, but these layers are just not neurons put together. These are actually different types of layers, and this was really the innovation. But we will have a course lecture about this, so I'd rather stop this here. Just take away the message that this requires immense computing. Of course, obviously, just recognizing a couple of digits um, is something which is not so computation expensive. But if you think now about satellite images, you want to have pixel wise determine, is it the water, is it the skyscraper, is it a tram? Um, much more complex images than having a cow or a horse identified. Um, those require massive amounts of computing and that's where cloud and high performance computing comes in. In a way you see that really summarized here and also this was a is a very famous slide, so to speak, where politicians were asking me, could you please put together all of these buzzwords in one lecture, in one slide? Uh, and you know, politicians have no time, so you have to do this. And this is a lecture slide I come up with that you know should know by heart in a way. You see here on the one scale, big data, meaning really the volume or maybe even the speed, where you see that traditionally we were analyzing data with tools like MATLAB, R, SkyKit-Learn to some degree, VK and Octave. But at some point in now, and by analyzing it means maybe machine learning models like random forest support vector machines uh, and sorts like neural networks you have seen. But usually you see that um, the 
it is breaking. So the, the kind of amount of big data is really breaking the memory we have in the system. You cannot always sample out. You can do this, but you will lose information. So you cannot do that anymore. And the traditional learning models are still there. So if you have small data sets, then usually they're still working, right? My, meaning the left-hand side where the um, small data sets are there, this kind of ranking in terms of accuracy that you see on the left is not really realistic because you can still have very good results if you do small data because with small data, usually deep learning is not very well because deep learning really needs large quantities of data, big data to scale well. And you see the other aspect here in the red footprint the red essentially means the training time of these networks. And the more training time you have, the more computing time you require usually. And this not goes for inference, the second part, so predicting once you have trained a model, usually it's very quick to use. Usually it's a training time that is really requiring high performance computing and cloud computing resources. And we will make a case about it in one of the lectures. Just to take away the message that really um, this is all connected, AI, HPC, cloud computing, big data. You see here essentially why deep learning is so successful today. It has large data sets, so big data is everywhere. The storage you have seen, you can buy a terabyte disk for only a fraction of money 10 years ago. So this is really everywhere. Um, but also the hardware was keeping pace. So we have new graphical processing units, which are not anymore just for games. They're also now for general processing and actually can do the job for deep learning particularly well with tensors and so on. I will shed light on when we go to the particular lecture. And another, let's say third pillar that really helped is the amount of software which is open source and available to us. I had master students really creating neural networks from scratch, implementing them in parallel with MPI and stuff. So today we have Keras, we have TensorFlow, TensorFlow 2, we have a PyTorch, different tools really available to the community open source, which really drives again, lots of innovation, lots of new ideas. And how that really can work is best explained maybe if you see here um, from, from one of my uh, research group members, Christian Bodenstein, who actually used this with a couple of friends, these technologies to create their own company, Soccer Watch, where they essentially just recorded a couple of games from soccer and now can let's say have the camera angle and also the zoom in zoom out really learned automatically following the ball so this is an interesting um, company that is also going you now extended to basketball to volleyball to every other sports area and was just created out of these tools given the momentum of big data and some cloud and hardware resources so this is also a tremendous um, idea setting now, what you can do with these things you will learn in the course, you can pull together different pieces of that in order to really create new exciting applications and yeah, new companies, if you will. Just a little bit about um, the DEEP project also because we use their resources and the University of Iceland and Jülich are both partner in this project. It's creating systems towards exascale performance and really follows a modular supercomputing approach that we will look in. Uh, in one of the later lectures as well. Modular in terms of different applications. We have usually um, not anymore the situation that high performance clusters or so have a very homogeneous workload. Instead, we have many, many different applications that use it differently, these systems. And we will see this in one of our lectures. For us, it's more important that we are able to use a data analytics module with some of the GPU resources in our course for one of our assignments. And I will be in touch with you with the Joymo um, that we have to do with UDoor, a so-called um, portal where you can then get your accounts and everything, which will be part of essentially assignment one coming out very soon. <clears throat> now, I think by now you think a bit more, okay, this course is around this. Now, maybe some practical aspects before we close the first part and dive more into the material. So some practical aspects are the Canvas tool now, um, definitely everything is essentially there. Um, for those of you who didn't see it yet, please make sure to get an account there. Uh, to my knowledge, everyone should have one um, and our course is there. You have the prologue lecture with several discussion topics already there. You have the slides up. 
you have uh, different links to some additional information, but I also will make sure that you have a little bit the, the outline of the next couple of lectures there. You will see on Thursday, we have a conference lecture. We'll tell a bit more towards the end of the lecture about it. But you will see also the next couple of lectures, when they are, will there be dropped? Will there be no lecture? This could be happening because I'm really an active researcher, usually traveling a lot, but in COVID-19, uh, everything goes virtual as you see on Thursday with this conference. Still, I'm very busy. However, um, this tool should be really your first one um, to look at for every ideas. But if you are stuck in some aspects, please don't wait too long until you miss too many lectures, until you're too late for the assignments or so. So please send an office hour request, but we can of course also do virtual then um, just send the request to me to my email. Usually people ask about the uh, assignments. So this is 40% of the grade um, because two will be 10% and one is a bigger assignment with 20%. Uh, for this, please create groups of two to three people together. Usually I would say two, but in exceptional cases, I can also extend to three. And um, this has of course some influence in the overall grade, um, which is mostly uh, guided by practical lectures. So I will do a webinar demo um, starting with next week, for instance, with Python, NumPy, and a couple of examples with Jupyter. But then you will do this in your assignments and you get a good uh, description around this. It's more like a walkthrough, not really uh, extreme deep programming. We do this in the high performance computing course, not in this course here. Every now and then I do quizzes, which are good preparation for your final exam. We did this in paper form usually to be best prepared for the exam, but given COVID-19, we will transfer this to the online space and I will announce them of course ahead of time. And usually it's very good to look on the things you see on the right hand side. Though so the yellow blocks are essential course material. So if you really know them by heart, then also the exam as, and as much as the quizzes will be no problem for you, right? So take care of the message that look at the yellow blocks is very important. Also focus here and there on the associated figures because also in the exam, usually you can paint figures that explain maybe more than many, many words. But this is really the key essential material you should have a look at. Every now and then there will be invited lectures, um, people from the company, Deco Genetics sometimes presented. As I said, we have Vern Global presenting, um, PhD students from me will present some aspects where they really aspect, uh, are experts in. So we have a very interesting course coming up um, and these are of course very important. Um, in former times, we had Piazza and given the situation that many of the discussion aspects are integrated in Canvas right now, I would tend to say we have to see how that works. Usually it has some benefits that in Piazza people can ask questions anonymously. Uh, as far as I know, that's not yet possible in Canvas, which stimulates sometimes the discussions. So my take on this is that we start with Piazza and if you see it is dead because nobody uses it, then we close it at some point in time and transfer everything to Canvas. Until then, I will be in touch with some login very soon. And of course, Gradescope was always there for grading in the last couple of years. This is now in Canvas integrated. But as we teach the first time for Canvas, we have to see how this integration look at, uh, looks like. And of course, we will see that if you have it in Gradescope, I see there's no problem that you can access it then through Gradescope. So there will be probably also coming an account or we will see how we cr cleverly integrate this in Canvas. So it is possible, but we just don't have used it very much yet. Some associated literature for closing more or less the first part here. Um, which would be then things which is very difficult to say because in a way there are lots of lots of books and when you write a book about cloud computing for science and engineering um, then you know or distributed computing high performance they are outdated very quickly so you will see I do always a very mix of resources but everything has a reference and in the end of the lectures you always have a bibliography where you can look up these but if you want some books that really help to understand the course material, these would be these four. Some from more from the cloud computing perspective, like the upper two from the distributed computing perspective on the left and on below more from the data mining perspective there. But of course there will be also big data tips, data NAMI, HPC wire, there will be websites I'm pointing it, which has very interesting material. 
Right, just as a, let's say, conclusion for the first part here, more or less, an appetizer for next year. So if you're bored for next year, don't know what to do or need another course, um, this could be one of it. So this is a complementary high performance computing course that I teach usually, which goes a little bit more deeper inside the metal, so to speak, how to do really parallel programming, how to use numerical methods, physical laws to do weather prediction, how we do land cover, um, simulations, smoke simulations, or you see there on the right hand, even crash tests. So computational fluid dynamics, uh, finite elemental systems. So this is all something we teach in that course here in this high performance computing course. If that's interesting for you, just take away the message that will be teach next year again. And with this, I have just a stimulating video here as a conclusion. Um, which I play now uh, shortly going maybe over time, but I think it's a very interesting insight into what deep learning can offer you. It all begins from a single orbit. A unique point in space and time. This is the spark of innovation that fuels your most amazing breakthroughs. It's a passion for discovery that unveiled the genesis of all that exists in the universe. Today, the power of AI helps computers achieve superhuman capabilities in image recognition. And let scientists save our most precious resources analyzing in one month what used to take 10 years. Everyday devices translate even the most complex languages from voice into text and images into words. ABU is now present. Helping the visually impaired recognize an old friend or letting a blind woman read to her child for the first time. Autonomous vehicles give us the freedom to reimagine our city streets and travel where there are no streets at all to help the lost find their way home. We see robots teach themselves to perform simple tasks. We even watch in awe as they take their first steps. And today, a 2,500-year-old game meets its match as a computer competes with one of the greatest human champions of all time and wins. This is the collective imagination, fueled by forward-looking technologies and the beginning of your most amazing discoveries yet to come. Okay, so this concludes the first part of the lecture. We will come back to the second part of the lecture and will then opening, of course, also the floor for questions. So let's break for 10 minutes and then come back maybe at, um, yeah, 14.25, small comfort break. If you have questions already, please feel free to put them in the chat so that we can later quickly go through them. <laughs> 